Welcome back to What You Alone. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we are doing... <laughs> Sorry, mate. Today we're doing the review. <laughs> mate, did you just fart again? <laughs> no, it was about five minutes oh, ago. Jesus. Sorry, mate. Uh, yeah, best of season two. So we're going from the, the second half of the season. So the first half was covered in our best of 2017 episode. This is from January 1st up mm. till now. Yeah, the first... I'll, to be honest, I was a little bit embarrassed by the, <laughs> the last end of year review. We were, we were absolutely we got, we got sloshed. We were off our face doing a podcast, <laughs> which isn't probably the best for the listener. But tonight we're you know we're having a couple. We've got the Johnny Black. Um, we started a little bit earlier, so we're not as many drinks deep, which is good. So it should be some good stuff. The best books, the best of the interviews. Now we're actually going to do this last week. Uh, I got stuck in um, stuck in Bali. Mm. Went to Bali for a week. Plane got cancelled. So. Uh, yeah, we're doing it now instead. Sucking in though, so yeah, that, that's a good thing, man. Mate, what's a bit of the plan for the episode coming up, man? So in this episode, we're going to kick it off with our top 10 books each. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, 10 to 5, and then we'll go dig down a bit more in the 5 to 1. After that, we're going to go through our top interviews, and then we're going to go through the big bonanza juggernauls of Lover Gadanza. Um, the competition prize. winner. The season two prize. We'll draw yeah. that right at the very end just to yeah. keep everyone hanging around. Mm. Um, but before we get stuck into our top 10 books, just to give you a bit of an idea as to what's happening now, uh, last month we did the same sort of thing. We had June off for publishing episodes and 1st of July will be this relaunch of season three with our juggernaut month yep. with a big, big, big five books. Absolute puffers coming your way. So we're going to kick it off with how to win friends and influence people. That'll be coming first up, yep. 1st of July. Tony Robbins next. Um, Awaken the Giant with Awaken the Giant. What else? Sapiens by so- Yuval Noah Harari. Yep, and then Gladwell, Outliers. And then uh, Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. So they're big books. Five massive books, not necessarily in that order. We, we don't have the order yet. <laughs> How to Win Friends is definitely first, and then after that, we'll work out the order. But five massive books in terms of impact, in terms of reputation, in terms of... Um, loved by millions worldwide. Mm, she'll kick off an absolute amazing season three. We've got ahead. We've got some great books after that as well. Some massive, uh, massive puppers. Juggers. It's going to be the, the season of the pupper. <laughs> Mate, so, that's, <laughs> so that's a ju- juggernaut month to kick off season three, the juggernaut season. Uh, so if we go retrospectively now, man, the, the uh, top 10. Absolute top 10, man. Of, so. uh, from 1st of Jan. So... Yeah, up to the 31st of May. What mm. have you got? So we have some rippers, man, and, and we'll kick it off with my 10th book, my 10th favorite. And for me, it was Essentialism. Nice, man. I uh, did not have that in my top 10. So what, what was uh, your favorite bits of Essentialism? So the idea of being an essentialist is it's kind of hard hardcore prioritization. So he kind of says, if you go a millimeter in a hundred different directions, mm. you're not going to make any progress mm. as opposed to just choosing one direction of what your priority is and just working on that and over time, you're much more likely to uh, make more progress. And he talks about the the um, unimportance of practically everything. Almost everything, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So basically he's saying you've got to say no to a hell of a lot of things in order to have one big yes. Mm. So by saying no to lots of the small things, you can say a big, big yes to that one important thing. And you know, it's sort of like, as you sort of said, Rather than going a mile wide and an inch deep, go a mile deep and an inch wide. So just picking that one thing to to focus on, picking what's essential and literally cutting away everything else. Yes, that's right. So, you know, you're making a lot of progress in the things that matter most. Yeah, nice, man. So as I said, not not top 10 for me. My number 10 will be coming up later. Mm, Yeah, it was a bit higher in your list. Exactly, it was. (laughs) Number nine (laughs) for you, man. Number nine for me, Power of Moments by Chip and Dan Heath. So I really liked it, man. We spoke to Dan Heath as well after this book, which I really liked, the interview. I liked this book, um, something different. It was about how to create moments that are memorable. So you know, across our whole lives, what are the things that we remember most? What are those key moments? And they boiled it down to four things, which was elevation, insight, pride, and connection. So a couple of my favorite things there. So he says that if you look at uh, you know a graph, if you were to graph you know your feelings as you know of moments, there's going to be troughs, there's going to be small dips, there's going to be small bits, and there's going to be peaks. So he says to make better experiences, firstly you've got to fill the troughs, the big negative things you've got to cut those out first. But then he says forget about the potholes, the little negative things, don't worry about them. Focus on making those peaks as big as possible. Hmm. So first step, fill the trough. Second step, build those peaks as big as possible. A few potholes here and there is okay. Hmm. Make a big, big, big peak. 
And retrospectively, at the end of your life, and this is covered in thinking fast and slow, it's the, the peak end rule. So if you look back and measure how good your life was, it is very skewed towards the peak events of your life. So if, if you have a lot of nines or tens peak moments, you can actually look at your average of your whole mm. life being much higher. So yes. if you can kind of engineer peak moments in your life, you're going to genuinely have a better life. And there's something that no other book has really kind of pointed out like this has. So it's a fucking, it's a ripper. Yeah, basically. nice, man. I've just thought, as you were talking about that, I mean, I thought of something off the fly. Mate, my recent trip to Bali for the week. Mm. So the peak was probably snorkeling and seeing a turtle that was sick. But then the end, getting the plane cancelled and getting stored for the extra you know 26 hours just stuck in a shitty hotel which was not so good so not a good end but he says that the other the other thing is duration neglect so if i go five years into the future and i'm looking back at this bali trip i'm going to forget about all the shitty stuff you know you're going to forget about spending six hours on a plane that's going to be completely neglected mm. you know that duration neglect we're just going to remember those peaks oh absolutely so yeah, always we always talk about the um if you're on a date yeah. Don't buy drinks all night. Don't buy <laughs> don't buy cheap beers. Buy one fucking what buy one Rupu cocktail for thirty one, bucks. One peak cocktail. One mate. peak cocktail. <laughs> and that's what they'll remember. Exactly. When they look back months down the track, they're not gonna remember the a whole night of beers. beers. They're just gonna remember one peak the cocktail. Peak cocktail. <laughs> so it's all the peak cocktail rule. We'll call that one. Nice mate. So what's your what's your what's your number nine? Number nine for me was the inevitable. Like Man, it, was a, it was a redoer. It featured in our first sort of six months worth of episodes. Mm. It's all about the technological forces that are going to shape our futures. And, and I think you're probably living under a rock if you think that technology is not going to impact your life between now and then the end of your life. So, mm. you know, like anything that. that kind of spells out how the future may be in terms of technology, it's, it's very likely to inf- impact your career. Definitely. And it's good to really read. As I said, we redid this one. I think it was the only, only the second time we've redone a book um, because we interviewed big man Kevin Kelly. And so he said that you know the book Inevitable was about the 12 technological forces that are shaping the future. And he said that in the two, two and a half years since writing the book, he's only more confident, um, like unwaveringly so, that these 12 things are inevitable, that they're, they're coming. He's got more examples and those 12 things that we detailed in that episode, they're, they're coming. So be, be ready for them. <laughs> yeah. Don't listen to the end of that. <laughs> we just listen to the um. We just listen to the song before we recorded this. Yeah, and we we're discussing if you were random and you just tuned in that for the first episode, and you listened to the last three minutes of just the song of that episode, you just wouldn't listen again. <laughs> Mate, that was, that was an it's awful a weird. Song. <laughs> it's a very weird. That's the weirdest moment of our lives, I'd say. Anyway. Mate, so number eight for both of us uh, actually features. Higher on in the other person's order. Mm. So we'll skip number eight um, and we'll go to number seven. So number seven for you, man. Seven for me was crushing it. You you loved crush it. I hate hated crush it. Yeah. I liked crushing it. You hated Didn't crushing like, it. Yeah, that's it, man. Crushing it, not in my top ten. Mm. Um, there's some good stuff in there. Yeah, there's of. a little bit there's a little bit of gold. There's a lot yeah. of bit of a, a bit of crap in there as well, <laughs> there's no doubt. But I really like some things he he talks about of you know, being in, in touch with business today, which is for him, it's a lot of a lot to do with social media and things like that. Yeah. So Gary Vaynerchuk, he says, you know, look, there's no better time to be an influencer than than today. And some of his advice is pick your one main pillar of content, splinter off a whole bunch of other smaller contents. But basically, you got to always be hustling, always be putting out a lot of content all day, every day, all platforms, just spreading your content. Mm. And the thing I liked about this book, which wasn't in crushes so much. It's the amount of emphasis he puts on work, like how mm. much hard work actually goes into it. Yeah. And it's not you're not just entitled to put in all this, um, you know, just 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 because you're passionate about the Smurfs, you can end up with a podcast <laughs> about the Smurfs and make a living off some, you know, real niche you're passionate about. It's going to take a lot of uh, p- uh, effort and eating shit. Yeah, the way he talks he about it before shit. you actually get to the end. Loves eating shit, and mate. One thing I did like, really like from crushing it, he says that everybody's got excuses as to why they can't start their own business or they can't just start something on the side with not enough time, not enough money, not enough knowledge, or any excuse. But he says it boils down to three key fears. The fear of failure, which he says is not so much you feeling that you're a failure, but of other people seeing you fail. The second was the fear of wasting time. But he says, look, what else are you going to be doing? You're going to be watching 
uh, lost on TV or watching Survivor, <laughs> but that's a, that's not a waste of time. But yeah, mate, watching, if you're watching news, if you're watching news, then that's a waste of time. Um, Survivor or, is <laughs> clearly. Or the a third waste one is uh, the fear of seeming vain, and mm. he says, "Look, what's worse, you seeming vain to people in the short term, or crushing it in the long term?" Mm. So yeah, so that was his three fears. I like that that part. A few gems it. in there, no doubt. Definitely. So we'll roll on to number seven for you now, mate. Thinking in bets. Uh, which I believe didn't make your top ten, but I liked it. I liked the the ideas of our decisions. You know, this ideas of making decisions and viewing all the decisions we make as bets. Because really, even though we're super confident, we really don't know everything that we're talking about. And so, any decision is really a bet on the future outcome. Absolutely. So, one of the things I liked about this is how she talked about how life is a lot more like poker than chess like chess you know whatever position you're in now there is actually a good move yeah and the good decision means good outcome but poker you can actually and in life you can make a great decision and have a really shit outcome yes but what we tend to do you can also make a shit outcome and get lucky yeah and get lucky yeah. and we usually use the outcome to determine how good our yes. decision was when sometimes you know we just forget that some things are just luck. <laughs> exactly. So he says we've got to s- distinguish between luck and skill and we've got to distinguish between the decision quality and the outcome. Uh, and essentially she says, look, you've got to admit that there's a bit of uncertainty there in order to learn more. So she says, you know, if it, if ever anyone says, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that this thing's going to happen. If you say, do you want to bet? They're immediately mm-hmm. making all the calculations in their mind that they don't say, actually, maybe they're not 100% sure. Mm-hmm. There's actually a bit of uncertainty there and that idea of actually betting is what reveals that uncertainty. Mm. One thing I really liked was this idea of motivated reasoning. Mm. And I think you're in a better spot to, to hit this for six than me. Uh, I wasn't prepared for that, but yeah, what was motivated reasoning again? It's this idea bias. when, yeah, a bit like confirmation bias. So say if you um, have got... I'm gonna play, <laughs> threw me out of the bus there, mate. Yeah, you go. <laughs> <laughs> mate, but motivated reasoning, I'm guessing that if you've got the desire for something to happen, an outcome, then all those things you're going to see, are, you know, a bit like confirmation bias, and that if you've already got an idea, you want something to happen, everything you see is going to support that idea. Yeah, so if yeah. you're smart believing something that's kind of false, mm. because you're smart, you can use your intelligence mm. to create false reasons why an idea is true, nice. as opposed to having, you know, let, being ignorant and understanding that you might be wrong in certain, some, certain, some, certain, some circumstances. So no matter if you're smart or dumb, we use reasons to believe our false ideas yes. as opposed to admitting we might be wrong and then moving in another direction. I like it, mate. We nearly fell off the wagon there, but we're back on track. So yeah. number six for me was The One Thing by Papa Joe, Papa Jay, Jay Papazan. Big Papa Joe. <laughs> so, mate, uh, uh, you said you had, you had essentialism in your top 10. Uh, I had the one thing in my top 10, which I think sort of similar ideas, um, but I preferred the one thing in that just, he, he sort of dispelled a lot of the lies of productivity that, you know, you've got to be fully disciplined all the time. Multitasking is a good way to get lots of things done. Accessing willpower is a good way to just get out there and do stuff. They're all lies. Mm. You've got to focus on the one thing. So you've got your big picture one thing for your whole life, and then you've got your one thing to do right now. Mm. So I like that I like that approach to productivity. Pretty simple book. Yeah, the book's full of analogies. The analogy <laughs> I really liked was the idea of the domino. Mm. You know, if you always have exponential growth, and say if your one thing is like, say, a magnitude of percentage bigger than the thing you're doing now, mm. and if you keep going at, you know, 30% bigger, 30% bigger, 30% bigger. With the power of exponential, you can actually, a small domino can eventually hit something, a domino the size of a moon after yeah. you know, a magnitude of 50 or something ridiculous like that. Mate, another, the other metaphor or analogy <laughs> I liked was the iceberg. So he says that, you know, the tip of the iceberg is productivity because that's what everybody else sees. If everyone sees someone who's super productive, they think that's all there is to it. But really, below that, below the surface of the water, you know, below the productivity is actually having a priority mm-hmm. so they've tied their day-to-day tasks to their longer term you know five-year goal lifetime goal and be- beneath the priority they've got their purpose so that engagement and meaning leading towards a greater sense of fulfillment and happiness yeah. so people just see the productivity but it's important to build from the base of purpose then priority and then productivity at the very end yeah that's it man and as long as for me as long as you're like going for a bigger domino as your next domino and you're always going for that growth eventually you can start taking down fucking ripper ripper dominoes yeah exactly man exactly um the domino on the iceberg on the map of the compass yes using the compass and the map of the domino <laughs> Lost it. good analogies yeah uh mate number six for you we'll wait we'll wait on that one yeah yeah 
Absolutely. Number five is for you, and this was my number eight. Yeah. The chasm. Crossing the chasm. Crossing the chasm by Absolute Jeffrey Moore. Hopefully, you're keeping up with these numbers. We're jumping, <laughs> we're jumping around a bit in that. We've just we've, we've tried to schedule these, so we're not. So up to number five on our number together. five. Number five for me. Number eight for you. Crossing the chasm. So he talks about like the normal distribution curve, a bell curve. At the very far left, you got your innovators, which is like the first couple of percent. Next, you got your early adopters. And the context of this is marketing. Who the target? Yeah, who nice. a whole market is Good right. Save, I just drop jump straight in. You jump did. straight in. Um, <laughs> after your early adopters, you got your early majority. And then past halfway, you got the late majority and the very tail at the far right, you got your laggards. Mm. So they're saying that essentially any new product or any new idea has to start at the far left with the innovators and it's got to make its way across um, through the curve. You can't just jump and be a mainstream idea straight away. Definitely. So the, the, the whole idea of the book is the psychographics of the people mm. in at the start of the, start of the curve, the early market. They're a bit like kindling. So when you've got something new out there, they're the kindling in the fire. They burn really quick, but they're absolutely ideal. But, you know, we want to take down a whole market. You want your big ripper logs in there in the fire, and that's more of your early majority mm. and early market. So the whole book is a higher, uh, an entire strategy of getting from the early market to the late market. So you've got that log burning there, and that's going to, you know, be a sustainable business plan. And as you said, man, so the psychographics between each of those five groups are different. Their needs, their desires, their problems are all different. So between each group, there's a crack. And so it takes a bit of a jump to get from one group. So there's a crack between innovators and early adopters. But the biggest crack, the chasm, is from the early adopters to the early majority. And that's the chasm where most people, most companies, most ideas die. And so that's what the book is about, is about crossing that chasm. How do you get from this cool new idea that early adopters are taking on mm. to hitting that, starting to hit that mainstream of the early majority? Because mm. the early majority are prag- more pragmatic yeah, and they're not necessarily going to listen to the early adopters who are kind of jumping around on all these new ideas. Yeah. So they're not going to listen to these idiots jumping around everywhere. So it's kind of this catch-22. You need the early majority on board first, and but... You've got the early adopters only, so there's there's yeah. this big chasm in the middle. Exactly, man. And he says the the main way to cross the chasm is to get super super niche, target one small small segment of the early majority market. So you're breaking down your early majority to one small niche. He calls it attacking the beachhead. And once you first get that first beach, and you go to the next niche, then the next mm. niche. It's a lot like war. This book, isn't it? It's, yeah, there was a bit of a war yeah, aspect to it. Yeah, definitely. It's all about taking down and murder and. <laughs> <laughs> All that kind of stuff. A lot of dead bodies in the chasm, mate. Absolutely. No, we'll just do a quick pause. I need to uh, refill refill the glass. Yep. Okay, go for it. So we had our burger again this time. Back on the, the Johnny Johnny Black, mate. Cheers, Cheers. mate. Oh, yeah. We never get a good... No, we had a Johnny Blue in one of our... <laughs> We've downgraded to the Johnny Black. Yeah, that's all right. That, I think that's good. No, we, never so, got a, we never got a, a glass that does a good cheers, though. It's a it was like a deep else. cheers. It wasn't like a real high-pitched yeah, clean. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, so that was my number five, crossing the chasm, and your number eight. Your number five, we're going to wait on. Um, mm. But we're going to number four now. Number four for me, Win Bigly by Scott Adams, which mm. doesn't... <laughs> Mate, I'd have shaken my head. Oh, what? Mate, it was a good I'd book. I'd have shaken my, my bloody head. How is this a, your number four out of all the good books we've done? This is just a Scott Adams is a, he's a lunatic. <laughs> oh, mate, I, that's, I hope that's he's not listening because we interviewed he's him. Not, he's not listening. I can almost get to that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, mate, he's a, you know. I thought he was a, um, I thought it was a great book. I must admit the book was a... Uh, it was very focused on the U.S. election of 2016, um, but I think the ideas of persuasion um, and hypnosis I absolutely loved. Mm. Uh, and I think that if anyone was going to go play Survivor, this is an absolute Bible yeah. <laughs> to read this first. <laughs> but man, I like the ideas of the cognitive dissonance, the confirmation bias, but then the ideas of persuasion, of setting the table, strategic ambiguity, repetition, um, all those he had about 30, 32 persuasion tips on the side. I thought they were top-notch Bible status stuff, persuasion. <laughs> well, the thing I really liked about this book was this idea of filters. Mm. So whatever, whoever you are and whatever stage you might find in your life, you can't avoid having filters of how you see reality. So there's, you know, who knows, billions of bits of information come through any second. Whatever filter mm. you see the world, you cannot, cannot avoid but just having some kind of bias with it. Yes. And that's probably the one takeaway I got from the book. The one, oh, man. <laughs> man. you gave it much more praise at the time, man. Yeah. <laughs> mate, well, your number four was a piece of shit as well. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so, mate. 12 Rules for Life by Big JP. Port- 
John Peterson. I tried as hard as I could not to get this in my top 10, but it, it, it came in at number 10 for me. Mm, it shouldn't be because I, <laughs> I think, I don't know if we said this on the podcast last time, but there's this something I call the Socko Factor. Yeah, we didn't mention it, so hit us with it. <laughs> so Socko is this mate of mine, David Sokoloff. We were both in year eight, and he used to try and get me onto new music. So he said, oh, yeah, it was this song by you know some, some rapper or something. And he'd sit next to me and look at me as he's playing the song. <laughs> and there's no way you could get into something when someone's just staring at you looking at how good's yeah. this how good's this mate I've done the um, and the I've been doing thing. that to yeah. you a little bit haven't I no well mate I liked Peterson I, I, I like Peterson I like his stuff and I like some of the ideas I just didn't love the book yeah. um, mate I've, I've experienced that Socko effect in that I was giving that to trying to get people onto Survivor and I just was oh, yeah. really, really wanted him to like it. That was me as Too well, much. <laughs> <laughs> Too much, mate. You had the that psycho a... effect with Survivor. Survivor, it's mate. Su- Survivor's <laughs> objectively shit. No, nah, that's wrong. That's objectively. Very wrong. Mate, but uh, 12 Rules for Life. Mate, I did like the first paragraph and the last paragraph of every chapter. It was just the 30 pages in between that were just random rambling that I thought went a bit off track. Mm, objectively wrong. Uh, <laughs> rule, but a few of the uh, good takeaways for me, man, yeah. was... Rule number one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. And yeah. I really like this analogy he pulls from lobsters. You know, they're 500 million years old and there's so much like us. And it's understanding that hierarchies, which there was a time in my life that I thought it was just a power structure and oppress, oppression from the, the top down on the bottom. But every kind of, every kind of um, animal, so to speak, does have some kind of hierarchy and it's a natural thing. Mm. Which is amazing. And so, how does that relate to number one? Rule number one: stand up. Oh, sorry, stand up straight with your, your shoulders <laughs> that's, back. Mate, that's what I'm saying, man. He's way off track. I don't know how it relates. Well, lobsters. <laughs> so the the top lobster on the top lobster in yeah. in their hierarchy had this kind of neurochemistry where it would ha- be in state in yeah. using Tony Robbins kind of words. And you know, if you're a human being and if you're in state and you're standing up straight with your shoulders back, you're expressing that you're on top of the hierarchy. Yes. So that's, that's where the that thing for the, for the lobsters. For them, in order to move up in the hierarchy, they had to fight and they had to win. But a lobster fighting and losing is almost life-threatening. So we're saying that the big dogs who stand up straight with their shoulders back, who look the biggest, they're intimidating that people don't want to fight them. So that's what we're saying there. Man, a few of the other ones I liked, rule number two, um, treat yourself like you would someone you're responsible for helping. So we're saying that if you had a kid or you had a pet or you had even a friend that um, you were responsible for helping them, whether that was giving them medicine or telling them what to do. You'd look after them a hell of a lot better than you look after yourself in terms of, I don't know, what you feed yourself, what you do with your life, how you exercise, all that sort of stuff that if you did to yourself what you did to someone you were responsible for, they'd, you'd probably be locked up. <laughs> so so you've got to yeah, look after yourself as though you were looking after a child or a, or a pet that you're responsible for. Yeah, definitely, man. And rule number 10 for me was my favorite in the book and it was be, be precise in your speech. So he says, everything clarified and and articulated becomes visible. So if you've got a problem with a mate or your girlfriend or whatever, and there's this kind of simmering kind of chaos Mm. underneath the surface, and a lot of the time you might be inclined to just look away from it and try to be blissfully blissfully ignorant, Mm. but uh, being precise in your speech is kind of speaking out what this kind of underlying yes. simmering kind of chaos is between you and your missus or your boyfriend or whatever. Yeah. And you, when you spell it out, you can actually attack it and you can slaughter it down. Exactly, man. And you can improve. Like that kid's story we talked about during the episode of the dragon. If you ignore the dragon, it's going to keep growing. But once you acknowledge it's there, then you can start to tackle it. And it might be a dragon which requires slaying or it might be absolutely nothing. Yeah, exactly. Once you vocalize it, it might turn out that it was just a silly thought all along. Yeah. Man, a few others... Um, Self-explanatory ones just from the titles. Rule four, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not who someone else is today. I like that one a lot. And rule nine, assume that the person you are listening to might know something that you don't. Oh, that's a ripper, isn't it? Man, uh, it was good. The 12 rules are sick. Mm. Not good for the Harry Potter effect. (laughs) Mate, number three for you. Is The Life You Can Save by Peter Singer. Nice. So I think I, I had that at... Yeah, uh, I had it number eight for me, but it's a it's a great book, man, and something different besides our usual sort of wheelhouse. But it's um, important stuff, man. Important to read. Absolutely, it's an absolute punch in the face for yeah. how you go about your daily life. There's no doubt there's a lot of people being lifted from poverty every day, but at the same time, 
by us choosing us in developed countries and, you know, spending our money right now. We've got our Johnny Blacks here. <laughs> At the end of the day, we spent, what, 60 or 70 bucks on this. Yeah. You can't deny the fact that's, that 60 or 70 is a good way of the way of saving someone's life on the other side of the world. Mate, there was a, uh, we could have probably fed um, 30, 40 people with that 70 bucks just for our Johnny Walker Black Label. Mm. So... So Singer's not telling us to go and just not drink Johnny. He's just t- telling us all you need to do is donate. He's got a sliding scale in the book yep. and you'll hear it in the episode as well. But 5% is maybe all you need. Exactly, man. Basically, he's just saying, look, if you're listening to this, if you've got the ability to, to buy an iPhone or equivalent and listen to a podcast, uh, basically, you've got it pretty good. Mm. And that we all can and we all probably should be doing more to help those people that are far less privileged than us. Yeah. And basically, he broke down a lot of the common objections to giving more. He broke down the psychology of why we don't give more. And then he showed us, look, it doesn't actually cost that much to save a life. There's a lot mm. of small things finan- like for us financially that have a massive impact on saving lives around the world. Mm. One big takeaway, man, is he kind of expresses how it's wrong not to give. Mm. So it's based on three premises. And the first premise is suffering and death from lack of food, are bad. So basically, it's up to you to decide, look, is it is that true? Do you agree with that premise? If you agree with that premise, um, then yeah, it's pretty much on to the next one, yeah? Yep. Premise two is if it is in your power to prevent something bad from happening without sacrificing anything nearly as important, it is wrong not to do so. Sounds like a pretty reasonable sort of thing to say. And the third premise, by donating to aid agencies, you can prevent suffering and death from lack of food, shelter, and medical care without sacrificing nearly anything as important. So he's basically saying with these three premises, if you do not donate to aid agencies, so by inaction, you're doing something wrong. That's his basic argument, man. So if you've got those three premises, if you can agree with those, um, then it's pretty much like, okay, well, you you know the obvious path forward then. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. I like it, mate. It's a punch. It certainly is, man. Mate, my number three is uh, your number two. Which is? So good, they can't ignore you. Mate, I really like this one, man. Number three for me, number two for you. Mm. So pretty um, pretty high up there, man. It's a great book, man. It really balances out a lot of these other books we've been reviewing, like, you know, Millionaire Fast Lane. Quit your job, follow your passion. Quit your job, the yeah. Tony Robbins. Quit your fucking job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this whole idea that your passion is out there, all you got to do is have the courage yeah. to just quit everything you're doing now and then just go and follow your passion and the whole universe will conspire to do everything that you know you deserve because you're privileged to this amazing life. Exactly, man. He said there was, he had two, two different ways you can look at life. One is the passion mindset. One is the craftsman mindset. So the passion mindset is that you know, there's some passion that we have that's out there. We're always looking for what can the world give us? Whereas the craftsman mindset is thinking, what can I give the world? What's something that I can commit to, develop skills, rare and valuable skills, build something over a longer period of time that, to, to really give back um, and become a craftsman, become a master in what this thing is rather than just thinking, what's my passion? What do I deserve? What, what can the world give to me? Because unfortunately, you know, he, there's, there's some three conclusions that he has about passion. And the first conclusion is that passion is rare. So he studied a whole bunch of Canadian students about who, what their passions were. And the top five were things like dance, hockey, skiing, reading, and swimming. Yeah. And pretty much only, sorry, less than 4% had, 4% had anything to do with a job or some kind of career. So passion is rare. The other thing is passion takes time. And the third one is passion is a side effect of mastery. So if you're going to be passionate about something, it's because you have autonomy competence or purpose yeah exactly man it's just saying that he's saying you know passion takes time passion passion is a side effect of mastery it's not just like i'm passionate about doing you know some of those things that you listed and you just quit your job and make money from those things it's sort of like something you get good at something you build over time something that you start to approach mastery you actually begin to like it more and that becomes your passion yeah rather than just thinking that i can just quit and follow my passion and everything will be perfect Mm. and if you follow the path of the the craftsman you gain something what he calls career capital you Mm. kind of got leverage so when you got skills and and using the title if you're so good that people can't ignore you because you've got this craftsman mindset 
then you can trade this this competence and this leverage or career capital to gain autonomy. You know, the idea of like, fuck it, I'm going surfing today yeah. or competence or purpose. You know, you can start choosing, I'm going to go for a company with better values. And cause people, because you've got some kind of scarce skills, you can actually start choosing these things. And that's where the actual passion comes in. Definitely, man. As I said, I really like that book. I reckon it's probably great. If you read like Millionaire Fastlane, read Rich Day Poor Dad, read Crush It!, and then you read this, it's a nice way to balance them all out. I already gave you a bit of a punch in the face with it. <laughs> now, I've read it, I've actually probably read it three times now. Oh, really? Um, I first read it because uh, Derek emailed Derek Sivers and he said, get on this one. And it was, um, I didn't like it so much at first. Hmm. And then as I've sort of, you know, read more and more books, it's becoming better and better in them over time. Yeah, it's really, it's very realistic. Get that. No, what do you got there? A bit of ch- roast bit of, um, we got Right now, we've got a bit of, bit of chocolate, a bit of roast, uh, old, roast almond, old gold, gold roast nice. almond. It's very nice stuff. How many um, lives could we have saved with this? This looks like expensive chocolate, mate. No, it's only four bucks, man. Oh, that's all right. It's good stuff. Number two. Number two for me, mate. Number two for me, um, Perennial Seller by Ryan Holiday. Mm. First and only Ryan Holiday book I've read. Uh, listen to a lot of interviews with him. He sounds like a pretty cool dude. But, mate, I really liked He's Perennial Seller. He's an incredible seller. author, man. He really is. Um, where did Perennial Seller rank for you? Number three for me. So, high up was for it? both of us. Yeah, it was. No, mate. It was number five for you on my list. Oh, <laughs> whatever. You had number three, Life You Can Save. No. Um, we'll, we'll recap <laughs> our top ten at the end because we're all over the shop here. <laughs> but, mate, Perennial Seller. Yeah, it's an absolute ripper. So, it's all about... Um, the first step of any creative for making work that lasts, so this is the mm. whole idea of having something perennial, it's if you make it now, it is so good that in 20 years' time, it's still there and it's still making you some kind of money and some kind of passive income. Exactly, man. If you look at like, uh, the way I really liked what we, we talked about it was the get it done versus get it right. So probably early in your creative career, get it done. So get a lot of things out there. And it's good to get into that habit of you can have an idea, create something, and Taking get it out action. there. Taking action—that's level one. Yeah. When you like read these kind of books at the very start, it's all about getting off your ass and doing something. Yeah, exactly, right? man. And it's and not that's necessarily going to be quality at the it's start. It's definitely a very, very, very important place to start—an important first step. But perennial seller is more about heading towards the other end of the spectrum of get it right. So once you can get stuff done and you have got a bit of stuff behind you, start to make something really, really good. Something that's going to last. Something that's going to stick around forever. Mm. And if you look at some of the perennial examples he uses in the book, it's kind of like Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. At the start, it wasn't like the craziest box box office hit because mm. it was so quality. It's still around today and still getting sales. So the actors and the writer and the director and all that, it's a perennial seller. They're still getting the benefits from something that was, what, 30, 40 years yeah, ago? Yeah, exactly, whatever. man. You're talking about the Lindy effect in that every year that something is around essentially adds an extra year to its um, lifespan. So if something's been around for 40 years, it's pretty likely that it's going to be around for the next 40 mm. years rather than something starting out today is going to be a very, very, very low chance it's going to be around in 40 years. If we think of some of our books like Seven Habits of Highly Effective People was written in like the, the 60s or 70s, Effective Executive in the 60s, How to Win Friends and Influence People was from the 30s. And like so those books that have been around 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, they're probably going to last the test of time and probably in 80 years' time they'll still be popular. Definitely. And one of the almost unfortunate things when you read this is <laughs> but when it's something's perennial and quality and these are the quotes of some who are really making these quality products and, and businesses or whatever but George Orwell says writing writing book is a horrible exhausting struggle like being driven on by some kind of demon George Lucas who did Star Wars was literally ripping his hair out when creating it and Elon Musk compares starting a company with eating glass and staring into the abyss of death <laughs> So creating something perennial, it's it's fucking tough, right? You're going to exactly. be eating shit and you're going to be going through an absolute slog to make something decent. It's exactly, not easy. Man. And that's it. That's At the very start, you're probably getting stuff done, doing things that are simple and just taking that action to get it out there. But when you start to shift towards the perennial side of things, uh, making it really, really good, that's really, really worth a lot of time invested, um, but hopefully is worth it on the other end. Mm. So that's so a good one. I really like perennial seller, man. Yeah, number me one too. for me, mate. Number one from uh, the last... Uh, Five months of books, 22 books we did from January 1st to now was The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker. Yeah, this is an absolute ripper. It's, it is perennial. It is perennial, man. So 
uh, I've, I probably should have looked at that. It was in the 60s mm-hmm. um, that this was made. And, you know, we've heard a lot about Peter Druck. He's this management guru, you know, one of the original thought leaders when it comes to management. We hadn't checked out any of his stuff. Obviously, it's a, a little bit dated in terms of some of the language. But, uh, man, I thought the book was great, man. The, it starts with like the eight um, habits of effective executives. Well, the, the eight questions and the five habits. I thought it was. I thought it was such a phenomenal book, man. Mm. A lot of it's. Can you read it again? Actually, almost. <laughs> yeah, we should. Yeah. It's all about this idea of um, doing the right thing again, but in yeah. a much more eloquent way. Obviously, like effective, not not efficient. So effect efficiency is getting lots of stuff done really quickly. You know, as cheap as possible. Um, whereas effectiveness is getting the right things done. So not focusing on doing a lot of stuff, but focusing on doing the right stuff. Mm. So my favorite part of this whole entire book by a mile, which I've definitely taken in my life, is this habit three, which is making strength productive. Mm. And he says, you, one cannot build on weakness. So if you've got this idea of being a well-rounded person or having a whole bunch of well-rounded people in your business is a really bad thing. You better have having people who are highly strong in areas and kind of um, in, in each part of your business. So then you're on average, highly strong as opposed to having a whole bunch of average people. Definitely. That's sick, man. And in my life, man, I've, just on that, you know, some of the things that I really don't like and I'm average at, which might be like, you know, writing reports at work and that kind of stuff, getting yourself in a position where you don't have to write that and you can stick mm. to your strengths, you do a much better job as well. Definitely, mate. Some of the other habits I liked, um, concentrate on few areas with superior results. So that's essentially like um, the 80-20, you know, focus on the 20% of really important things that lead to 80% of the results. And the other thing was just know where your time goes. So know, you know, a lot of time is wasted. Hmm. Know where your time goes. And he says, you know, throughout your week, find those small chunks of discretionary time. So things where you've got full control over what you can do in that time. And he said, try and get as big a chunks as possible. So you can really sit down and focus on something for a long period of time, not just 10 minutes here, 20 minutes here, 15 minutes here. Try and get one big chunk of, you know, four hours where you can really commit to something and, and really be effective. Mm, that's it. So the effective executive starts with the time they've got, not the task. Yes. Bang, yeah. bang. It's good stuff, man. I liked it, man. I liked it. I liked and it a lot. Habit five, just quickly, man, was the element of decision making. So. Mm. Effective executives do not make many decisions. They focus and concentrate on, on important ones. So someone who's not effective can really make a, a decision willy-nilly, but in the book he talks about how an effective executive might, you know, you might block out four to five hours just to make one crucial decision. Yeah, nice, I man. Really like that. Sorry, man, I'm just quickly, I was quickly typing something in because there was a couple of books that we really loved this, um, this half of the season. Um, the Effective Executive and So Good They Can't Ignore You that we wrote these, you know, 15, 20 page summaries of them. So if you head to whatyouwillearn.com slash summary, um, you can check out those two summaries. We'll, we'll email them to you. You can click on the, the links down the bottom there. Yeah, I absolutely. thought they were really good. You know, obviously 200, 300 pages is a lot of time to read, but if you can check out the summary, there's there's plenty of good oh, mate, shit in I there. read them. You wrote those ones and they're absolute fucking creepy. Mate, I said we, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all you want, <laughs> But mate, great books, man. So number one is actually my... It is my favorite book of all time. Yeah. I've said some other ones around about there, but this is, without doubt, the this book has, without doubt, had the biggest impact on me. So it's called The Easy Way to Stop Smoking by Alan Carr. Yeah. And if someone's listening right now and you're a smoker, I am extremely, extremely excited for you because if you listen right now, the best moment of your life is about to come by potentially reading this book. Mm. Now... Quitting smoking was something I previously thought was impossible to do when I was a smoker. I was like smoking 40 a day when I was living in Turkey for a little bit. And That's I thought, a lot of smoking. I was, I was hardcore and I, fucking, yeah. I love CDs, man. <laughs> and anyway, I, I read this book and at the start it said you can quit easily and immediately and permanently without willpower, aids, substitutes, gimmicks, without suffering depression or withdrawal symptoms, without gaining weight. I was like, yeah, bullshit, mate. That sounds completely bullshit Absolute to a bullshit, smoker, doesn't it? Yeah. But I'm telling you right now, whoever's listening, it is... It is yeah. true. And um, we don't necessarily have to go through the whole what the book is right now. But the idea is that smokers, it's, it's you know, you, you believe that you smoke when you're stressed and it gives you benefits there. You smoke for concentration. Um, you know, it's, it's really a trap. And f- mm. for your whole life, do you want to be a, a slave to this cigarette? Because the average person who doesn't smoke, they're always at this, say, level of content. When you're a smoker, you you decrease in your contentness and then your cigarette, all it takes you is up 
to where the normal person is anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but you convince yourself you're having this momentary high with the, yeah. the non-smoker is anyway. So. <laughs> so it's like you're always going negative and that having a ciggy brings you back to normal. <laughs> yeah. So you think it sounds hard. Mate, so I, I've never been a smoker myself. Uh, I can't really think of hardly anyone in my immediate family that's a smoker either. Um, so it didn't have a super impact on me, but I love the book in that it, it breaks down a lot of the lies that smokers tell themselves like you mentioned that you know it gives me better concentration it it gives me a sense of enjoyment it relaxes me and all those lies that they um tell themselves as well as then talking about some ways that people make mistakes in trying to quit so he says things like you know patches and gum and depriving yourself and gradually cutting down the ciggies all that stuff doesn't actually work and in, in fact it probably makes it harder to quit definitely man that's a great point i'm glad you brought that up. so the normal way of quitting is all those things like patches and when you quit smoking, you avoid you avoid people. It's this whole idea that you're missing out on something. Yeah. So when you quit, you're suffering the whole time because you want a cigarette but you can't. Yeah. Whereas the easy way to stop smoking is you go out and you party on the day you quit mm. because it's so great to be to be out of it. So the whole mindset's different exactly. and you associate in your brain like positive things to quitting and it's a real piece of piss after reading this book. <laughs> yeah, I liked it a lot, man. As I said, no, no specific impact to me, but it, it was a really well-structured book in that uh, you know, uh, kills a lot of the lies, says a lot of the most ways people do it is stupid, but this is a, an easy way, and it's a, the most enjoyable way. As you say, man, best day of your life when you quit. Mate, whenever it's we talk book. about this book, I get really nervous that I'm not selling it hard enough. Right? Yeah. Because it really <laughs> is the be careful best place to effect, time. mate. <laughs> <laughs> mate, but I sold this. I sold this book to my my mum. Got her to read yep. it. My mum's boyfriend. They've been smoking their whole lives, mm. and they quit like that. My brother, his girlfriend. I have got mates. Man, this book just, just smacks it for six. So if you got someone who you love who's a smoker, give them this bloody book right now. Yeah, exactly, man. I couldn't agree more. Mm. Mate, well, that's our top ten. Let me. Um, as I said, we sort of jumped, we went in like order from 10 to 1, but jumped all over the shop in terms of our personal 10 to 1. Should we give our own uh, 10 to 1? Just no. a quick recap, mate. Number 10 for me, 12 rules for life. Number 9, power of moments. Number 8, the life you can save. Number 7, thinking and bets. Number 6, the one thing. Number 5, crossing the chasm. Number 4, win bigly. Number 3, so good they can't ignore you. Number 2, perennial seller. Number 1, the effective executive. Mm. <laughs> no, mine's not mine's not very neat but, but ten, uh, I can pull, mate I'll help you out here mate this is Adam Jones's top 10 <laughs> number 10 essentialism number 9 the inevitable number 8 crossing the chasm number 7 crushing it number 6 the effective executive number 5 perennial seller number 4 12 rules for life number 3 uh, is uh, the life you can save number two so good they can't ignore you and number one the easy way to stop smoking I don't know why I had your top ten better than you did mate but yeah, absolutely mine was <laughs> just a bit that scared, uh, mate. 151 I think IQ um... genius memory <laughs> <laughs> oh mate it's only the second time I've mate, you, you've, mate you've mentioned it way too many times that's the but, second time mate it's been <laughs> Jay asked me about it so I personally, had to tell him <laughs> I hear it every time I see you now <laughs> I know you got an IQ of 99.99 or whatever, mate. And all those dumb idiots don't have a, don't have what it takes on you. They don't have another drink. Hit pause. Let's, let's hit pause. Let's uh, we'll, after this we we'll get into our top interviews. Absolutely. I've restocked Johnny Black. So now Go that we've done our favourite books, our top ten books, we wanted to talk about some of our favourite interviews that we've done. So I think we did fourteen interviews since the start of Jan. Uh, some mate, some heavy hitters, man. Heavy oh, hitters, definitely, man. I really loved to kick it off. Doctor Carl, someone I used to listen to on Triple J, mm. seems like this kind of weird, awesome dude who knows a little bit about everything. Uh, you know, mate, that's exactly who he is. He's exactly a bit weird, is. <laughs> a bit weird, bit kooky, but awesome and knows a lot about everything yeah. and genuine, <laughs> genuine, mate. Legend of a bloke. I'd, I'd say that was my um. With no order here, but I'd say it was my number my number one of the of the yeah. this half of the season. Man, went to his his place in Sydney. He showed us how to stack a dishwasher hmm. to get absolute maximum efficiency. Um, <laughs> and mate, he was just a legend of a. Talks about renewable energy, and at the time I wasn't drinking coffee. <laughs> You're back on, mate. He, <laughs> hit that, <laughs> he hit that idea for six and said how good coffee was for you. And then subconsciously, the part of me that was really addicted to coffee, absolutely loved that. <laughs> and two weeks later, I was back up to five cups a day. <laughs> back on it. Mate, so I thought Dr. Carl was a legend. He does a book every year. We'll probably try and hit him up again, man. 
Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to catch up with him every year, man. It'd be sick to do an annual thing. That's just. From our perspective, I don't know if he wants to do it, but we'll see, we'll see how we go, mate. I think he liked us. We got along with him. We'll see how we, we'll see how we go. Yeah. The next one was uh, Danny Heath. Mate, I, I must admit, man, I really liked uh, Dan Heath. Love both. So we did Switch and The Power Moments um, so far in season two. Uh, love both of their books, man. Him and his brother, Chip. Hmm. Love speaking to Dan. Thought he was a sick dude. Yeah. He's more than anything, man. He's just a really... I think he was just one of the best guys I've ever, ever come across. He's very down-to-earth and genuine. And he has this amazing or great idea of just writing mm. people letters and just showing genuine appreciation of what people have done for you. We'll give a quick 30-second snippet here of um, that Dan Heath episode. You know, one of the things we talk about in the book is, is really one of the simplest, which is um, the idea of a gratitude visit. And this is... a in the discipline of positive psychology, where psychologists are studying what are things that make us happier, uh, this is probably what would be considered a greatest hit. Um, and so, so the, the instructions are very simple. You just think of someone who's made a difference in your life, and you write them a little letter that talks about what they did for you and why it was so important. And then here's the important part. You, you actually deliver it face-to-face. And so uh, if you can physically get in the same room with them, that is, that is plan A, B, and C. If that's utterly impossible because you're across the world, you know, do it on Skype or somewhere where you can see each other on video. But the, uh, the research is, is just astonishing. What they find is that uh, people who deliver a gratitude visit like that are happier for a full month afterwards. A month. I mean, there, there are a lot of pleasures in this world uh, that can spike your happiness level for minutes or hours. There are very, very few that last a month. Man, it's just a, a really cool idea. It's like, you know, in life you can have some of these things that are comfort challenges. That mm. is actually a really uncomfortable thing to do is like go up to someone who you care about and it is very awkward and uncomfortable and just tell them genuinely how much you appreciate them. But I think as a comfort challenge, it'll literally make your life a lot better. Definitely, man. As you said it, the positive effects to you for giving it can last months and just imagine what it does to the other person who receives it as well. It just seems a little bit awkward, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Get to get but over that. A good, good in the best way possible. Mate, uh, just a, I, I guess a bit of behind the scenes. Mate, Dan Heath, um, he was the only bloke out of you know however many we've interviewed so far. Obviously, every book, uh, every inter- we do a book and then the interview. He was the only bloke who said, "Hey, can I listen to the book episode first? And look, we never expect anyone to listen to our half an hour of talking shit, but he listened to it and then he was able to then not repeat the same stories. He was able to make references back to the previous episode. He even checked out some of our other episodes to say, you know, I like this, uh, you know, book from your book club. So I thought he was a he was a legend, man. Hopefully, we'll do another Dan Heath book and talk to him again. Oh, definitely, man. He's he's, he's a bloody legend. And on the theme of Dan. Next one is um, the big pink. <laughs> AKA. One, in the, one in the pink, two in the stink. Absolutely. <laughs> mate, which is almost the, the reverse way to uh, the common phrase, but uh, mate, if that's how you like it, that's how you like it. Mm. But Dan Pink, um, again, one of the guys that like, you know, the start of the podcast when we started reading books would have been like the, the pinnacle. Dan Pink, imagine if we could speak to him. So that was great to be able to speak to the, the great man, Dan Pink, on the uh, eve of the launch of his brand new book, When. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Have you got a bit of when? Uh, I haven't got a bit of when, mate. We haven't read it yet. Um, the only mate, the thing we have got from Dan Pink, though, is uh, is when we were recording the episode of To Sell Is Human uh, oh. in uh, not this specific room, but about three meters the other way, right next to the neighbor's house. Mm. Um, we must have got a bit loud it's on very Sunday morning. Man. A lot <laughs> of times this season, we've talked about you know the importance of not being a little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> And my, I'm not always a little bitch, but, but my my little bitch colours in this moment shown through. But what we didn't hear off recording, trust me, I taught this dude a lesson. <laughs> mate, you you wanted me to delete delete this. You didn't want it in the episode. I said, mate, no. this is getting in there. <laughs> Let's rehash it. Fully informed, they're rational. They act out of self interest. They weigh up the costs and the benefits, and they choose based. Hello? Who's that? Like a 
this time, what's the matter? Well, fucking open up. I have to do What's the matter? Fucking shut up. Okay? Yeah. Don't fucking hear. Like you never people, okay? Yeah, we'll quiet down. Well, just fucking shut up. Okay. How do we tackle that? I think it's a yes, yes, yes. He's probably... The boy is gonna fucking. Oh, he really would get bashed us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. he's not a fan of the potty. <laughs> he hates so, the potty. So we're recording right now at my girlfriend's house, and um, obviously there's thin walls or something because the, <laughs> the guy next door he was he had to just <laughs> slaughter us. <laughs> he kind of bashed the door down. So the next. <laughs> <laughs> dude, the next day I was speaking to him, and he's this big Eastern European dude. He's yeah, like, you know, he sounded kilo. big through the door, he's through big. the closed door that we hid behind. But he was saying how, like, you know, he's, he partied the whole night. But he, he was obviously loaded on drugs. I think. Yeah, I don't know. He's off his face, this dude. Mate, it was it wasn't that early, man. It was like what nine or ten on a Sunday morning. Hmm. But we did do a a yes, yes, yes. Tony Robbins pump up sort of thumped our chest just to get warmed up for that episode. <laughs> Obviously, a bit much, bit much for him on a Sunday morning. Yeah, we weren't warmed up enough to take him on, were we? <laughs> <laughs> Mate, he wanted to open up. We didn't fucking open up we that door, open did up. we? <laughs> no, not at all. Anyway, oh, Jesus. Fuck, that was, that was a highlight of the season, though. Next time, mate, if he comes down, we'll, yeah, we'll teach him a lesson. Yeah, he isn't, he isn't back being since a pussy. Mm. Um, yeah, so that was the bit about Dan Pink. What about... Uh, Who's next? A bit about Peter Singer. Peter Singer. So the most famous, most influential living philosopher, he's a, a heavy hitter, man. He's the man in the world of philosophy. Um, as we said, you know, the life you can save, not in our usual wheelhouse, but uh, great book to read, great dude to talk to. Mm, mate, Different sort of way of thinking. Behind the scenes, he was a really good guy as well, right? Legend. Uh, another one we did in person. Um, went to his office uh, when he was in town. Yeah. And great, great convo. Yeah, what did he hit us with? Man, he talked. Well, we we talked about a lot of stuff. So he he started, you know, four and a half decades ago with uh, a, a book called Animal Liberation. So he talks about you know animal rights, not eating animals. He talks about poverty, which obviously the book like that we covered. He talks about things like you know the utilitarian philosophy when it comes to abortion, when it comes to disability, mental disability, all these sorts of things that. Um, we didn't dive too deep into, but yeah, yeah, animals and, and poverty was what we focused on. It's good stuff. So yeah, hit us with some Pete. Uh, there is plenty of room, especially people who live in affluent societies and don't have to worry about where their next meal is going to come from. There's plenty of room to do good things for others. Uh, and, and this is where the psychology research comes in. There's lots of evidence that actually you will find that fulfilling, that you'll enjoy your life more if you're open to helping others, um, that it gives you purposes which go beyond yourself and purposes which actually don't become sort of, you know, there's a thing called the hedonic treadmill, that if you try and say, oh, well, I want to have more consumer goods, I want to drive a better car, I want to uh, you know, have a bigger house, um, that these things make you happy for a short while, but after a while that disappears. Whereas um, the rewards of, of helping others and knowing that you're living in accordance with your values seem to be lasting ones. That's some powerful shit, Peter Singer. Oh, Man, another absolutely. one we liked, Chip Conley. Chip Conley is good. Do you like older women? Yes. <laughs> Important life questions, Chip Conley. <laughs> Mate, you were pretty, uh, pretty, you were pretty adamant on that yes as well. <laughs> you love those older women. Mm. No, Chip Conley, what a, he was an absolute legend, man. We were um, meant to see him in person in Sydney, but uh, yeah, my, my fault in the scheduling there. I was yeah. in, uh, in Bali. Missed well, I asked him to go up. to one of his big birthday parties he throws, and he said yeah, no. Well, mate, well, he didn't say no, but he, in he's, a roundabout way. F- I think he's 57 now, so the next one's 60th, so we'll work on him. Yeah. See what we can do we'll there. send him an email after a few drinks. Legend of a bloke, mate, we, we didn't mention his book, Peak, but I loved how he took Maslow's hierarchy of needs, turned it into a three-level pyramid and applied that pyramid to employees, mm. customers, and investors. I thought it was um, cool stuff, man. Absolutely. It's been a long app, man. Are we, um, what's, are we, is it the time? Um, well, mate, so I, um, the Johnny Black is kicking in for me. We've got one, one left that we, we love the interview with Tom Peters, man. Oh, so he's yeah. pretty much the, the original, <laughs> sorry, mate, I'll, just, I'll let you cough. Um, you good? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, mate. So Tom Peters, the original man when it comes to business books, you know, in the '80s, business books used to be textbooks, mm. very inaccessible, you know, academic journals to the layman. But they first tried to, you know, bridge that gap between the mm. the academic side and the the everyday man who wanted to learn some 
cool business shit. Mm. I'm not going to lie, man. When I first heard of him, I didn't know who he was. But then I was speaking to someone who's a bit of an older generation, you know, between 50 and 60. And he said he used to charge like hundreds of thousands of dollars per oh. hour. He was like the number one man in the world for kind of business consulting. Mate, I, I, like hadn't, Jim I hadn't read him today, I guess. Yeah, I hadn't read his books, but I knew I knew who he was. And Seth Godin talks about him a lot. And, mate, he was an absolute freaking legend of a bloke in that uh, he had a brand new book come out cool called dude. The Excellence Dividend. Uh, and we, mate, we were lucky enough to somehow jag a, a last-minute interview in his, his book launch tour. Uh, here's one of our favorite bits. Maintaining a supportive culture is so important that I believe that one bad apple spoils the barrel. And then he says what you said when you introduced the question. He said, look, there are a lot of talented people out there, you know, sticking with that biochemist thing. Don't hire jerks. And, you know, I've used pretty primitive language sometimes in the book. And, you know, there are a lot of equivalents to that, which are, you know, not necessarily to be used in public. Don't, you know, like, just to use one of them, don't hire dickheads. In the airline industry, uh, the American airline industry, I really am a believer and have been for many years in Southwest Airlines. Uh, Colleen Barrett, who I believe started as a secretary and ended up as president, said, we look for listening, caring, smiling, saying thank you, and being warm. And she insists that that is absolutely positively as requisite for a mechanic or a pilot as it is for somebody who's a flight attendant or manning the front desk. Mate, so Tom Peters, as I said, we, we jagged in late into the, the book launch. Mate, I think that was 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. we did that interview. Yeah. And there was a dog in the background as well. <laughs> um, little Charlie, but he, man, he liked the dog. He had a new puppy Mate, I think well. you, because um, you've been, I'm very grateful for you organizing a lot of our interviews. I don't think you've cooked the um the time zone difference a few times. <laughs> Man, I, get, was... I, I get a text message every now and then saying, you know, Tom Peters, 3 a.m., <laughs> two weeks. I'm like, fuck, mate, come on. <laughs> <laughs> mate, that was, uh, I figured, look, it's Tom Peters. He's the OG, the original yeah. man when it comes oh, to business books. Like that, they yeah. gave us a time, mate. I didn't have any choice in that, but yeah. <laughs> That's true. Mate, but so that was, uh, that was our favorite interview, some of the favorite snippets. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed a little bit of... Uh, Throwing a few of our favorite bits in there. Mm. Mate, so let's, uh, we'll head towards the prize now, just before we do, mate. Um, yeah. the, well, we're having a month off, as, a, as yeah. a quick reminder. We're having our, our month off, and then we're going to, first episode back will be 1st of July, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, if you're looking for more episodes over the next four weeks, patreon.com slash what you will learn. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash what you will learn. We're going to chuck up a few bonus episodes there. Yeah. Um, for anyone who wants a, a few, you know, a couple of books, a couple of interviews, we're going to chuck them up there over the next uh, couple of weeks. Yeah, absolutely. And also a few early access. So, you know, a few of the, so uh, the bonus episodes, I guess, are ones that just didn't necessarily get on our feed. Yeah. Because uh, we're, we're pretty strict with, you know, one a week. Yes. We don't want to, you know, a lot of other podcasts we listen to, they jump it up to <laughs> two a week and extra bonanza bonanza Tuesdays and fucking whatever. Exactly. But we're, we're happy to keep, we prefer to keep just the highest quality we can, I guess. Exactly, man. If you can mate, say that. A, mate, so the, so there's, uh, there's four episodes up there at the moment already that you can listen to straight away. And then over the next month, we're going to chuck up another four or five. Mate, one is called The Prosperous Coach, which is probably one of our best songs at the end. Um, not a song of ours, but we found a video about about life coaches. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> and then, so then we got we got a couple of interviews. Brad Stone, who wrote uh, the Everything Store, all about Amazon. So we're going to chuck that up. And probably your favourite interview made a bloke named Peter Fitzsimon. Now uh, Peter Pitts. <laughs> Peter- it was a health book, a good book. The great Aussie bloke Slim Down. No, it wasn't a good book. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a good book. And this guy, it was our let's worst face it, he was he's the biggest dickhead. I've ever come across my whole entire life. Peter Fitzsimon, so he's this Australian. He wears this big red bandana and he comes on the media every now and then. Comes across as this really good bloke. So me and you thought we'd rock up to his house and he, he's married to, uh, what's her name? Um, She's hot. Lisa Simpson or something. Yeah, Lisa Wilkinson. Lisa Mate, Wilkinson. let me tell you, before we went... I said to you, we're about to jump in the Uber. I said, oh, mate, this guy's going to really look after us. We were going on a Sunday night to his house for the interview. And I said, oh, mate, should we go buy three steaks in case he cooks us a barbecue? <laughs> <laughs> mate, my expectations. We think we'd be hanging out, out a few beers with the good old Pete Fitzsimmons. 
we ended up sitting on the. He made us sit on the ground while he like acted like <laughs> King Dick. Anyway, biggest dickhead ever. If you want to listen to an interview, we didn't even say anything because we were going. <laughs> it's about a twenty-minute monologue. Of him. It was, mate, it was, it's funny if you it, in retrospect. <laughs> he's a dickhead. But anyways. <laughs> Now that we've really pumped it up and really sold it well, we've got, we've got five great episodes coming up on the on the Patreon over the next couple of weeks. Okay, man, I think it's time. Uh, if you're still stuck in around, thank you very much. Uh, stuck in, that's not a word. Obviously, the Johnny Black's kicking in. But, mate, it's time to draw the prize. So, uh, over season two, we thought, you know, we'll... Um, We'll have all the books. We'll have a big giveaway, the big Bonanza Extra Special Mega Bonanza prize. So in announcing the prize, you're probably picturing us having this big Wheel of Fortune or something where we're going to announce it, but I'm using We've got Excel. a virtual Wheel of Fortune. We've got yeah. a virtual Wheel of Fortune. It has the same amount of probability and effects. Yes. So at the moment, we've got the three. So we've got the survey. So we've got the reviews, the people who did the survey, and the people who sent in saying they bought a book. Yeah. Um, so we've got 30 who did reviews. We've got 86 who did surveys. And we've got nine who sent us they did a book. That's it, man. We want to be completely transparent on that. Yeah. On the numbers. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's not a hell of a lot. Considering <laughs> we had about a quarter of a million downloads. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, if you did, if you went in this survey, it was probably definitely worth your time, man. If you, <laughs> man, if you ever think it took three minutes per entry, you know, 130 entries, give or take, uh, for a $1,500 prize, it's a it's pretty good odds, I reckon, actually. Oh, absolutely. So in, in future, if you're listening right now, it is it, a- out of the quarter of a million people who've been listening, um, you know, we've got 125 entries, so it's probably a good use of your time, basically. As I, mate, as I was saying before, that uh, uh, another podcast, Seth Godin's podcast, Akimbo, uh, he asked people to submit questions, and I thought, oh, there's so many people listening to this, I'm never going to get my question on, so I'm not going to bother. Mate, he doesn't get many questions on there. No, he doesn't. <laughs> so it's one of those things that you think that, oh, yeah, I'm never going to win. There's so many entries. Maybe there's probably not Absolutely. as many as you think. <laughs> anyway, so um, enough about... So we've got 125. I'm using Excel. It's a formula called Rand Between. So Random number generator. So we've got the, the number for every single entry. We've assigned a number to it. We're going to do a random number. And so if it's between 1 and 125, whatever it lands on, that person is going to win. So I'm That's doing it. it right now. I'm clicking boom. This is and the draw. We're spinning the, the wheel. We're spinning the wheel. Drum roll. Hello. <laughs> it's two. Two. I'm two. Okay, let's Which see. Which falls the, into the Pold Rover category. Let's see who the winner is. So this goes into iTunes reviews and just looking at it, man, I, I really like this review. It's by j.c.london. From the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland on iTunes. I've got a feeling we might have read this out. I think I think we have as well, man. I've, what was the it. review? So it says the title, excellent for readers or writers. It's quite a long, long one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs Goodness. snobby book reviewers on Goodreads when you have a couple of sharp, happy-natured and down-to-earth Aussie guys doing it infinitely better? The first shows were ropey but raw, and thankfully, it's that raw core talent to understand books and present them for an audience that's remained. This effectively is the reading comprehension we hated at school mm. done brilliantly and enjoyably. Two heads are definitely better than one, and it results in an enhanced yet better still practical analysis of the books and topics they tackle. Whether you're thinking of buying a book they mention or whether they, um, you want to hear another person's insight on it, this is a great podcast. I expect they will grow from strength to strength as the service is a generous one. Awesome. Mate, you're right. That is a long one. But cheers. J.C.London, <laughs> I'm guessing from the UK. Do you deserve it? That was just that one was, of our top good, reviews, man. man. Thanks to the 125 entries for whether they were surveys, buying a book, or um, or an iTunes review. Uh, so, I oh, don't know who that is, though. J.C.London, send us an email, podcast at whatyouwillearn.com. Um, send us an email before the first episode of season three, and we'll... Uh, get in touch, mate, so we can send you these books, because I don't him, know who we'll, it is. We'll give him a bit longer than that, I reckon. give him a bit... The middle of July. The <laughs> middle of July. Send us an email at j.c.london yeah. from the UK. <laughs> but yeah, good on you, man. You got what? How many books, man? 50, 50 bloody books. There's going to be a lot of punches in the face, as it's you would say. Punches in the face. But So thanks uh, again to everyone who entered. We're going to uh, alter the, the prize mechanism. It's not going to be a year-long thing. It'll probably be a, a monthly thing, I'd say, <laughs> next yeah. next season where we'll, we'll give away maybe the best from each month. We'll work on that. We'll work on that, mate. Mm. But so from here on... A couple of weeks off unless you're on the Patreon and uh, get ready for How to Win Friends and Influence People on the 1st of July, 2018. 
Mm. Thanks so much for listening. Season two, done and dusted. Any final words, mate? Absolutely, man. We're just going to say, uh, people who've been listening for a while, they probably noticed we've stopped, we've dropped the song. Yeah. We, the, no uh, one complained about it. But, <laughs> that, mate, that, that was, we were sort of in a, in a point where, you know, probably six to eight months ago, we we're like, should we continue with the song? The survey responses said we should. Then mm. we got to the point where we thought, okay, if we drop it, is anyone going to complain? Didn't hear a peep. We had a few. So, oh, we had a few people. Complain. A few people said, uh, "You know, we had the hashtag bring back the song, which was a great review as well. Uh, yeah, a recent absolutely. one from the UK as well." But let's do a song, mate. Yes, yeah, so I, I reckon, um, dude. I reckon J dot C London. <laughs> he deserves a song. Let's, let's sing. Do. Let's sing him on. Let's do a season three, season two song, mate. JC London, you're a lucky motherfucker. You win all these books and learn lots of shit. Get 48 books and 48 punches in the face. Yeah, yeah. Seven habits of highly effective people. Listen what they say and then say what you want to say. Yeah. 52 punches in your face. Stop with why. What are they gonna do? No. Why are you doing it? Yes. JJJ, J, J, now J to JJ, you're gonna have 52 punches in the face now. Switch, ride that elephant and whip that guy in the ass and change that track that you're on. Oh, 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 JJJ, JJ, 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 The easy way to stop smoking is just to stop. Don't try to cut down one by now, one. Now, JJJ, you're from a developed country. You can donate 5% of your income to save some lives on the other side of the world. In Big Lee, be Trump and influence lots of people. Then email us to get your books. Email us to get your books by first of all. <laughs> Do one thing, one big thing, and one thing right now. Take the domino to the sky. Just keep growing, keep growing, keep Make growing, Jay. Keep 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 growing,